Hi, and thanks for choosing to listen to the eSpecial Needs podcast. I'm your host, Katherine Blanner. This podcast was created as an incentive to help working parents get the information they might need to benefit their child. We figure you're busy, you're driving the kids to school, maintaining a personal life, and it, that's all kinds of tough. But we wanted to meet you where you're at and give you the chance to listen to us talk about things that might help you and your child while you're driving, doing the dishes, cleaning up after the kids, and whatever else might happen during your day. Today we're going to talk about ninja therapy, but before we talk about that, we want to introduce ourselves first. E-Special Needs was started in 2002 by Carrie and Scott Corey in St. Louis, Missouri. Our recent incentive is to offer support and information to our community through providing diverse researched resources. We are excited to share our knowledge, support, and resources once a month on this new E-Special Needs podcast. Today, we are sitting down with occupational therapist Emily Martin to talk about ninja therapy. So for starters, tell us about yourself. So my background is is kind of a little, my background's a little crazy. So I graduated from OT school in 2006. Um, right after OT school, I went into burn rehabilitation. Um, everybody thought I was a little crazy because I just got out of school and now I had to learn how to be a general therapist and then I had to learn how to be a burn therapist on top of it. Um, I was lucky that I was able to work uh, quite a few years at some pretty, uh, pretty amazing uh, burn hospitals, one here in St. Louis, Missouri, and one in San Antonio, Texas. Um, once I got married and had kids, um, I was married to a man who was in the military, and I left Texas for North Carolina. While I was in North Carolina, um, I got to work at Fort Bragg, and I still continued to work with both adults and um, children in an outpatient setting in North Carolina. So I had the burn experience, which was inpatient, which was essentially a polytrauma experience. So I saw everything, including um, head injury, spinal cord injury, burn, amputations, um, just anything that you could name, we saw. And then when I went to Fort Bragg, we were the only outpatient clinic in that area. So we had every diagnosis that came through the outpatient clinic, both adults and both pediatrics. Um, I tended to get a lot of the pediatric patients just because I look like a Cabbage Patch doll and I'm friendly. <laughs> so the kids tend to, tended to like to work with me instead of the other OT. Um, once my husband retired from military service, we decided to move back to my hometown, which is here in St. Louis, and I actually had complications with my second kid. Um, I had complications during my pregnancy. I had complications during the birth. Um, my husband ended up moving me back right before he deployed, and he was gone for a year, so I was at home with an 18-month-old and a newborn, um, kind of going, okay, what's next? You know, what am I going to do? I can't go back to tr traditional rehab. Um, I have this kiddo that now we know has um, some sensory processing and some developmental delays, and so I started working for community. Um, I really enjoyed working in the community because as an OT, I really feel that there's a disconnect between the medical model, there's a disconnect between school, and there's a disconnect between community. And it's not by the fault of anyone, it's just essentially kind of how, um, essentially just kind of how the models are laid out. You know, an outpatient, you get to see them when they come in to see you. You know, you give them the tools to be successful, but you don't get to see them in the home and the community. At school, it's such a focus on education. And our school-based therapists now are becoming essentially jack-of-all-trades because they're seeing so many different um, diagnoses and, and so many different levels of disability that they now have to become case managers and therapists. Um, so I was lucky that I got to go into a role where I got to go into school, I got to go into clinics, um, I got to go into the home. So I could really see where people were struggling. Initially, it started working with more home modifications and vehicle modifications to hopefully um, lessen the burden of care on caregivers and to um, provide kids the things that they needed to be able to access their community. It was amazing to me how many referrals that we were getting for kiddos that were um, that had sensory processing issues, um, executive functioning, behavioral stuff, unmet sensory needs, mobility issues, everything that was hindering their ability to have good quality of life and be able to access their community and do, you know, their number one occupation, which is play. With my own child, going through first steps and going through diagnosis and doctors, I was learning so much more that I, I pretty much was able 
to um, dedicate myself to learning more and exploring more and learning from parents and you know great resources and different teachers and pulling from my past experience working in the various fields that I was um, able to work in and be able to pull that all together to now where we are providing support group needs and we're providing assessments for um, home mods and for vehicles and helping with sensory screens to determine what's the appropriate sensory equipment to help people actually get through their day or be able to you know get themselves dressed and be, you know, help their families be organized and essentially also provide them with community outlets and, and resources in order for parents to be empowered and advocate for their kids. Um, so it's been quite a journey. I started my career in one area thinking that I was always going to be in burn rehabilitation. And then throughout um, the last essentially 13 years, it's just kind of there's been doors that have opened that I've been able to walk through and it's led me into this new role that I have. So how'd you come across these special needs? So actually, um, when I started in the community, I worked for a non-for-profit organization. Um, I was able to work with um, different vendors in the area. The grant was was a really good opportunity for me to learn about case management services, to learn about the community needs. Um, I had always been a medical model therapist, so I was very versed in insurance and I was versed in coding and productivity standards, but I hadn't had a lot of experience in community. Um, so the grant allowed me to really learn about like the Department of Mental Health and um, other grant organizations and other community resources that were out there. I was approached after I left working for the grant. I left for a couple reasons. One, I was um, I was going to spend more time at home with my own kiddo because at that time we were going through a lot of uh, doctor's visits and kind of going through diagnostic procedures, trying to figure out what was going on with my kiddo in order to provide her with the support. So I left the grant. My husband at the same time was retiring and he ended up having surgery. So it ended up being kind of a crazy time. And a few weeks later after leaving the grant, um, I had met Scott Corey, who is the owner of eSpecial Needs, and I had known him through the grant, but just as a resource that provided equipment. You know, he was always there to help support me if I had questions. Um, I tend to ask a lot of questions because I like to know what I'm talking about, and he was always one of the vendors that I was able to always get kind of a straightforward answer, or if there was something that I wanted, because as a therapist, a lot of times we just say, okay, we want a shower chair, mm -hmm. you know, or we want, we know what we want, we want a swing, but we might not know the name or might know know all the components that go with it because to be honest we're the ones that are doing the interventions we're not necessarily always kind of figuring out which piece of equipment we want unless there's something that we really like and we start using it over and over again so he had approached me and he had talked to me about coming on um, Eddie's special needs to look at community advocacy and education it seemed like a really good opportunity for me um, I was able to have flexibility to be able to help support my own child and husband um, during you know my husband's recovery and his retirement and figuring out what was going on with my kiddo and being able to get her, you know, the, the right supports that she needed. And I needed a job that was flexible. And throughout the struggles that I had, because as well as my child having um, some issues with developmental delay, my husband has a 100% disability rating from the Army. And so trying to navigate the VA process with my husband and trying to navigate through um, early intervention for my own child, basically at the same time, I was able to learn a lot and I was able to share that information and I found that there wasn't a whole lot of people that would kind of give you those answers so I wanted to be able to share kind of the struggles that we went through as a family on a wider platform Scott gave us the opportunity or gave me the opportunity to kind of take that desire to provide community advocacy and kind of roll with it um, which has been great you know it was definitely a learning curve I left kind of what I knew as a therapist and basically came into this um, into this role, but we've been able to provide a lot of really great um, education resources, a lot of great advocacy programs for families. We're starting our support group um, um, with a foundation called Love Wills Foundation that has, um, has the goal of being able to provide uh, uh, folks with counseling services um, because caregiver burnout's a real thing. You know, so that's something that I'm pretty passionate about as a therapist, as a mother, as a caregiver. Um, we all have these roles that we end up living and sometimes sometimes we need extra support to make sure that we're we're going about in the right way. So it's been it's been it's been kind of a neat journey to be able to do that. Nice.
So you've gone from burn victims mm-hmm. to being a support for the community and helping you special needs do evaluations and so sensory screens. And- so everything is therapy. Um, I teach or I, I help out at a local university. And whenever I work with my students, I tell them therapy is everything. There, and it doesn't matter what population that you're working with, what age they are, what diagnosis they are. As an occupational therapist, we are walking into somebody's story. We're figuring out where they are at that time and what we can do to help support them to get to the next chapter. You know, so it doesn't really matter what your diagnosis is. There's a lot of really similar foundations across the board. Um, and when you work in one area, you tend to have a little bit of tunnel vision on things and now that I've been able to cross over into different areas of practice you really see how things come full circle you know um, I get to work with little kiddos I also get to work with adults and with working with my adults with developmental disabilities um, who also have you know history similar to the soldiers I worked with in Texas you know some of them have trauma backgrounds some of them have multiple diagnosis you know some of them have Um, needs that require wheelchairs or specialized medical equipment, you know, so um, some people, you know, will start um, being completely cognitively intact, have something happen, and now they have cognitive deficits, you know, you can see it everywhere. Um, Sometimes people can come into a situation and have no mental health issues and then come out and, you know, require mental health support because now they have this trauma experience. So there's a lot of things that kind of, kind of, actually overlap each other, which is really cool part about therapy because you can kind of see everything kind of coming together and you start seeing similarities like, oh, I might have this kiddo, you know, who just recently had a diagnosis of autism, but he's more struggling in like executive functioning tasks, you know, where I might have had a soldier who had a traumatic brain injury that that's, they were doing really well, but they were still struggling in executive functioning. So you can kind of see where these things you know, you can use similar treatment interventions and and build upon it and use different tactics from different areas of practice in order to to really make a good individual plan for these people. So that's been kind of a neat, a neat, um, I guess, uh, result of moving into these different areas. Interesting. So the idea of ninja therapy is your idea. Yes. So, <laughs> so ninja therapy has kind of started out as a joke. So let's face it. Nobody wants to do therapy. I mean, it's, I mean, I try to make it fun. Um, but a lot of times when I worked in burn, you know, therapy is painful. Nobody wants to participate, even though I look like a cabbage patch kid and I'm super fun. You know, people might not want to do what I need them to do. Um, so the whole, the whole idea behind, behind ninja therapy basically came about because, um, I always, like I said before, therapy is everything, you know, so if you need somebody to, um, you know, you need to be able to achieve something like, so I'm going to take it back to burn. So in burn, I needed to achieve like in, improved range of motion or, or to prevent contractures. Contractures are where the skin in burn is where the skin essentially kind of shrinks and it limits how you're, uh, you're um, able to move. So my therapy goal would have been able to go in there and to provide stretching or stressing of the of the skin um, in order to be able to to um, achieve greater movement. Well, let's face it, that's painful. Nobody wants to do that. Um, so I I kind of coined ninja therapy because I would sneak in during like nursing dressing changes or during like a distracting um, activity in order to get in there and get my exercise and get my stretching without them necessarily noticing that they're doing this thing that I need them to do. Um, so I always kind of took that with me. Um, and then even when I went into outpatient, you know, a lot of times, um, if I worked with a hand patient who um, was having difficulty with fine motor coordination or or um, having a lot of pain, you know, my ninja therapy would be, um, you know, sneaking something in that I needed them to do. Whether that could be like, hey, let's, you know, let's do something fun or, you know, at the end of a session when you did your initial evaluation, I used to have them trace their hand and then color in their hand. Well, I would have them use their affected hand, you know, whatever was painful, if they had a lot of swelling, I would um, give them, you know, um, a different size pencil or a different size um different size crayon in order to get more of a grip or less of a grip or whatever I needed to do. So that that's kind of your ninja therapy. So basically you're sneaking in things that you need to be done um, 
when you have somebody who might be reluctant to do it or reluctant to try it or it might not be a preferred task for them um, or it might be something that they're they're you know um, not wanting to do because it could be scary it could be painful um, it could be something that they're just not really interested in but it is a goal that we need to achieve because let's face it with a lot of kids they don't really care about self-care you know <laughs> they don't really care about like taking showers or you know the steps of brushing their teeth you know so um, if you can kind of sneak in there get them to do some other stuff while you're getting them to do the goal that you have set that's that's where the whole ninja therapy kind of came about. So it's just subtle ways of getting therapy to a kid that can sometimes be disguised as like a fun task mm -hmm. or just a necessary task. Yep. It's all subtle. You know, um it's it's very funny cuz a lot of times therapy might look just like play and that's okay. That's what you want it to be um uh, because kids actually learn and they retain more if it's if it's fun and if it's play. Um it's their number one occupation. Sometimes we forget that. You know, so um, a lot of times I'll sneak in different therapy, um, different therapy tactics with play. And it's not it's not a new concept of what I do. Um, majority of the therapists, especially pediatric, especially school based therapists, they all have some sort of ninja therapy tricks that they do. I just cr called it ninja therapy because um, I thought it was silly. I think <laughs> I think it's a fun term. Um, I tell my students that all the time, like, hey, you're sneaking in, you're getting what you need done and you're getting back out like a ninja. Um, so that's the great thing about occupational therapists is they all are very creative. They all have their form of ninja therapy, and we all learn from each other, and we learn other ways of ninja therapy. They might not be do know that they're doing ninja therapy, but they are. All right, so let's talk about ninja therapy and individuals with sensory processing disorder. So what are some suggestions that you have for somebody with sensory processing disorder? So a lot of times the common theme tends to be with parents is um, self-care stuff. Um, I hear a lot of times, I mean, yes, you see where um, you have sensory seekers, sensory avoiders, um, you have people who have mixed sensory needs. Um, Could you go into that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So with sensory seekers, those are the kids who seem like they can't get enough movement. You know, they are jumping and climbing and swinging and they can never, they have trouble maybe sitting down and kind of focusing on, on a task. Um, sensory avoiders um, tend to be the kiddo who seems to be more cautious. You know, um, I always joke around that sensory seekers are like the leapers and sensory avoiders are like the thinkers. Um, I tend to I tend to be more of a leaper. <laughs> so I usually I I kind of self-diagnose myself as a seeker. Um, but we all everybody has sensory processing issues. It just depends on how it affects your daily life. You know, for me, I'm a person who I avoid certain things because I know I don't like it, but I'm able to understand that. Um, I'm also able to um, have different compensatory techniques that I've adapted over the years in order for me to be able to tolerate certain things, whether it be meetings or whether it be loud, you know, crowded places, things like that. But some of our kiddos with sensory processing, they just don't know where to start. Um, they don't know um, how to start developing those compensatory techniques. And so sometimes um, those, those um, because they have trouble figuring that out, um, it, it seems, to be, um, it, it kind of just keeps kind of growing. And parents, the parents that I meet, it tends to just be to the point where, um, you know, they quite don't know what to do. You know, they have good supports in school or they have good supports in outpatient. Um, those two areas are doing really well, but then when they get home, life kind of gets in the way. And they're like, well, you know, I know I should be doing this, but you know, I also have this going on and um, I have other kids or we have practice or we have to make dinner. So a lot of stuff gets in the way. So um, I, I really try to, I always defer to their primary care therapist, you know, since I'm kind of coming in as a, um, as an advocate to help them find resources, things like that. So if they do have a primary care therapist, I always defer to them because they're the ones that are seeing them day in and day out, know this kid better than I do. But through observation, through seeing how they are in play, through discussing with the parents, through um, developing a relationship 
Um, I always say that the kiddos that I see, the parents that I meet, we become a village. You know, we want to, it takes a village to raise a kid, so now we're just a part of this really big village. So I tend to have um, developed pretty good relationships with a lot of these families. So I get to know the kids over time, and I get to see how they change and they develop. But the common theme at whatever age they are seems to be the trouble with self-care. You know, it's usually not such a preferred task. Um, transitions are hard. Um, sensory needs change. That always tends to be very frustrating for parents because they think, man, I got it. I know what my kid needs. And then the next day, bam, there's something different. And that's okay. We want their sensory needs to change because that's a good thing. That means that need is being met. And now we're kind of moving on to something else. Um, so some ninja therapy stuff that I usually talk to parents, I really try hard to talk to them about, um, organization, organizing their day. You know, I'm a mom of two kids, um, so I understand that life does get in the way. So simple things that you can do, um, like I like to do um, like the five shelf clothing organizers. They have ones that have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday on it. Um, Ninja therapy for me would be on Sundays. You as a family, you work on picking out your clothes to put in those organizers because then during the school week, you can go through if you use a visual schedule or you have a checklist, anything that you use to kind of help you keep you on track, you already have the clothing picked out. Um, so that's kind of one of those things to help lessen some of the burden on the parents and you kind of give the kid the ability to be more independent with, you know, ch choosing their clothes or clothing retrieval, whatever skill you're kind of working on. Um, another ninja therapy thing is the use of like a time timer. So time timer is a really great clock. It's probably my favorite thing ever. I'm not, it's funny that I work for an equipment company, even though I don't really do anything with the equipment. Um, I tend to not be huge in equipment. I really like to um, adapt the environment to the kids' needs, whether that be through, you know, giving the parents ideas on different um, activities that they can do or how to set up their house to be a little bit more organized for them. Um, but there's the time timer, which is my favorite. It's a 60 minute clock that you can pull down. So say like you need 30 minutes in the morning to get ready to go to school. You can pull it down to the 30 minute, give a visual, um, a verbal cue of, hey, look at the clock. We got 30 minutes before we have to go. And as the as the time goes, the red starts to leave. So by the time the 30 minutes is up, it's back to being like a white face clock. Um, so it gives the kids uh, a visual place to start. It gives them an idea that time is this real thing um, and allows them to start kind of organizing themselves and figuring out time management on themselves, on themselves. So that would be for me like a nice little ninja therapy thing because they, they, it looks like to them that you're just kind of keeping them track, keeping them organized, but they're learning a lot of other different skills. Um, and so that's another ninja therapy. Um, other stuff that you can do is we always want our kids to be as independent as possible. You know, kids are super competent. Um, a lot of times life gets in the way, and so it's easier for adults just to kind of do the task, whether it be like tying shoes or uh, putting their jackets on or zipping them up, something like that, just because, I trust me, I know. I have a four-year-old. If I tell her it's time to go, it is like <laughs> trying to get a snail to go through peanut butter. I mean, it's, it's just frustrating. Um, but... You know, allowing our kids to be able to do that, giving them checklists or schedules or, you know, even using the time timer, um, allowing them to try to, um, um, even if they they don't do it the right way the first couple of times, giving them that support and giving them that chance to try um, is going to allow them to be able to learn that, master that skill and move on to the next one. Um, so other ninja therapy things that I talk about is like having like a central location where you do like a big wall calendar, you know, um, like a month calendar. In that calendar, you can post things that are up and coming so they have a visual schedule. It's also a place for you to jot notes down. You know, if you start noticing different behaviors, you start noticing that kiddos are reacting different to things. Um, if you start noticing that, um, you know, your kiddo is more tired or um, having a hard time focusing or if there's a skill that you guys are working on, write it down on the calendar. It gives you a visual place to start. It also gives you a record. And then if there's like a new skill that you're trying to learn, if you document it on that calendar, every time you look up, it gives you that feedback of, hey, look how 
how far we've gone. You know, back at the beginning of the month, you weren't able to do this, and now look at the stuff that you're being able to do. Um, that's a really great motivation because it's giving you something that shows your progress. Um, same thing with journaling. You know, those are more ninja therapies, um, therapy techniques for parents. Um, because if you journal and you discuss kind of what's going on, like in your day or what you see, or if there's like a certain behavior you're starting to notice, write down what happened before that behavior and what happened after that behavior and how they reacted to whatever intervention you provided. Whether it be you provided them a deep hug or whether you provided them just by leaving them alone. You know, write down how they responded to that because then you're going to start seeing trends that are going to pull through there, which might help you figure out out if there is an intervention that you need or if there's a piece of equipment that's going to help support your kiddo at home you know so that's kind of a ninja therapy um, trick for the families you know because I see a lot of my families that come in they feel isolated they feel like they're in a bubble or they're on an island and there's a lot of families out there that are feeling the same way or seeing similar things and by kind of tracking the stuff that you see you can start flipping through and you can see if there's a trend um, of different behaviors or different reactions or different things that might um, kind of trigger your kid. Um, if you see like an increase in meltdowns at a certain time, you know, or if you see um, they have a hard time um, or they have more sensory needs during school breaks, you know, I mean, and that's kind of one of those things that you're like, oh, well, that makes sense because they're not in school. But sometimes when you're living life, you don't think about that stuff, you know, because you're just living, okay, what's for dinner and what do I need to do? And I got to get, you know, so-and-so to practice and things like that. So by actually taking the time out to jot that stuff down, it may give you just some insight on, okay, well, let's try this. Or, hey, you know, school break's coming up. I know last year he had or she had an increased difficulty time because he was off school for so long. So maybe there's ways that I can get some of those needs met, you know, during that week and start planning accordingly, things like that kind of help support your kid. So I could talk a lot <laughs> <laughs> about all this different stuff, but um, it's basically subtle, like you said, subtle ways to be able to get the kiddos what they need. So let's say a kid is struggling in the classroom. What would be a, like some interesting ninja therapy ways to help with that? So in the classroom, um, some kiddos that I see will have OT. Some will have OT as a consult. Some um, will have... Um, will no longer have OT service for whatever reason. Either they are, um, like I joke around that they're too good for us, or, um, you know, maybe they have a, a more pressing need somewhere else. And um, so a lot of times I always recommend, first thing, if your kiddo's having trouble in school, um, you know, make sure that you touch base with your teacher. Make sure you touch base and see if there's a school-based OT that could kind of come in and kind of assess the classroom. Uh, to determine if maybe there's something going on in the classroom. Um, I'm a big fan of just switching out chairs, you know, having alternative seating things. Uh, I know for myself, I don't like to sit still. Um, <laughs> so, like, get some bouncy bands. Yeah, bouncy bands or um, even, like, those wobble chairs, those core strengthening chairs. One of the things I saw a lot in an outpatient where I, I would have a lot of kids that would come in and they would have complaints of, like, pain. Um, there would be nothing wrong with them, but they had so much pain or they would get really, their arms would get really tired or, and a lot of it was just kind of, you have these kiddos that just have this poor core strength, you know, and they don't have good core strength and then it's affecting so much other stuff. Um, you might have kiddos that can't concentrate unless they're bouncing, you know, and, so and they might need a yoga ball. Yeah. They might need something like that that helps with focus. You know, they may need to have, um, something weighted on them during times where they actually have to be providing good focus, like during test taking and things like that. So with school base, it's all about trying to figure out different ways of meeting those needs without disrupting the education process for all of the kids in the classroom. Um, making like a tactile thing for their desk that they can rub. I know there's a ruler that you can throw onto a desk that has like the different tactile bumps that kiddos can rock on. Um, you know, slipping something in their chair like a wiggle seat, something like that where the kid can weight shift in the chair, but they're not going to disrupt their students. 
even like the things that can go in back of pencils that they can chew on, stuff like that. Because again, they're going to get that proprioceptive feedback. That's where a lot of our proprioceptors are. Um, if they can't get up and move because it's just not appropriate for what's going on in their classroom, they're still going to be at least meeting some of those needs. So that would be more like the ninja therapy stuff, that subtle ways that they look age appropriate, they look like they should be in the school. So it's not going to be distracting to other students, but the kiddos are going to get what they need. One thing that I really think is ninja therapy, and I wish I had figured this out because I would be on a beach somewhere. Um, but I see a lot of weighted stuff like they're making like weighted hoodie sweatshirts. You know, that's awesome because it, it looks just like a sweatshirt. And that would be, if you're looking at equipment that needs to be ninja equipment, that would be a ninja piece of equipment uh, because it looks like a normal sweatshirt. It looks age appropriate. You know, it looks like the kiddo, you know, you and you want your kiddo you want your kiddo to start realizing or being able to identify what kind of sensory support they need. Um, and then if if they are getting good with that, they know what they need, they need that, you know, deep hug or that deep pressure, throw a weighted sweatshirt in their backpack, you know, and then if they're test taking or if they're having a hard time focus, kiddo can pull that out. It just looks like a sweatshirt. Nobody else knows what's going on. I think a lot of companies and a lot of people are getting real savvy with that because um, sensory equipment sometimes can be disruptive whatever yeah, environment that you are. and it can look are. clinical too. And it can look very clinical and it can, and you know, kids have a hard enough time growing up. Like, right. <laughs> you know, and other kids not, can sometimes be, um, you know, can, can be a challenge at times. So, you know, by finding pieces of equipment or different um, strategies that they can do, you might even teach them different strategies like pushing their hands together. You know, it just looks like they're stretching, but it's a good way that they're getting some feedback through their joints, which might help them, you know, achieve a calm alert state, things like that. Um, so those would be all little ninja ninja techniques for school. You know, you want it to be, because the teacher has a hard enough time teaching all those students, you don't want to give them anything that's going to be super disruptive. Um, but when it comes to school-based, I always defer to their OT. They're the best people. School-based therapists, I take my hat off to them because they have a big job. Um, so if you have questions about anything that would be in school, seek out your OT, you know, because then they can tell you a little bit more about the school environment and the school culture and what's going on in regards to their classrooms or um, regards to their hallways or just give other suggestions that might help your kiddo um, be able to have a good day at school. What do you think about fidgets? Uh, see, fidgets are one of those things that... If the kid needs them, that's great, but fidgets are also one of those things that has gotten really popular. Yeah. Um, so, and that's hard. So, they do have, like, other fidgets that, like, go on the back of pencils, and they have... Like the Chewies. Yeah, too. yeah, and they have other ones that are, like, nuts and bolts, you know, they look like fun, like, little nuts and bolts that you can do. I use a lot of that stuff for, like, hand strengthening, coordination, um as a way to help with mental focus, you know, so I think that they have their place. You want to make sure that your teacher's on board, which normally they are, but you also want to make sure that our kids are aware that there's certain times that we can pull things out, there's certain ways that need to be appropriate, there's certain things. There's also classroom etiquette that we have to think about too. So that would be a discussion that I would have with my teacher, with my parent, and with my student to figure out, like, when do you need that? You know, like, what's going on? Is is there something that we can do, or is it during, like, no offense teachers, but if they're bored, um, during, like, a certain subject, or they're having a hard time focusing or, you know, maybe it's that time that's like between lunch and the end of the day when our bl blood sugars all drop and we need a snack and it's hard for us to focus, you know, so identifying some of those stuff too is, is helpful. But um, as far as fidgets go, yes, but with the thought of, okay, when's the appropriate time to do that? You know, make sure the teacher's aware. You don't want to disrupt any of the other students because yeah. a lot of times they can just look like fun little things that kids want to play Because you want to make sure they know they're not a toy. It's not a toy. This is actually to help with <laughs> achieving some sort of need. So we're going to move a little bit away from ninja therapy right now, and we're going to talk about the number one question that parents have for you when you see them and do evaluations. So a lot of times when I see parents, I hear a lot of um, a lot of the same things. I hear I didn't know about a lot of these resources. Um, I don't know what kind of where to start. You know, I see my kiddo is doing all these things, like they're jumping on furniture or they're climbing or, you know, I don't know where to, support, to start in regards to sensory supports. Usually through conversation, um, we'll start talking about sleep hygiene. 
you know, and then we start discussing, oh yeah, my kid has a hard time falling asleep or my kid has a hard time staying asleep or, you know, my kiddo won't sleep in their bed. They have to sleep next to one of us or like one of their siblings. Um, so we talk a lot about sleep hygiene because if you don't have good sleep, you might see an uptick in, I guess you could say behaviors during the day. Yeah. Cause they're just trying to keep themselves awake. Yep. Trying to keep themselves awake. If you're sleep deprived, if you are super sleep deprived, it can, you know, cause seizures, things like that. And so being sleep deprived is, is no fun. Sleep hygiene is really important. I always try to talk to families about that. Um, The other thing is I hear a lot of people talking about how, man, my kid needs total assistance, you know, or they need constant verbal cueing and constant reminders. You know, my kid is out eight or nine, you know, they should be doing, you know, the goal is for them to be doing more self-care stuff on their own, you know. What are they going to be doing when they're teenagers? And there's a lot a lot of that worry, and it's the same worry that all parents have. You know, we want our kids to be as independent as possible. We want them to have good quality of life. And, you know, I know an OT um, who's – she's – She's a super smart lady. And, you know, I've been in OT a long time. And when I was going through everything with my own kiddo, you know, I had a hard time. Um, I was kind of, I kept focusing in on, okay, what deficits was she having? Like, how do we address these deficits? Because I was just, I had my mind like, well, oh, I need to get this started and we need to do this. And she stopped me and she said, you know, you've been, you've been in OT a long time. And, you know, you tend, I, t- I, as a therapist, I tend to be a cheerleader. You know, you can do it. You got it. Let's try different ways. I joke that I'm a kitchen sink therapist. I'm going to throw everything at you and including the, the kitchen sink, um, you know, so I tend to be really positive. But when I was dealing with my own kid, I just kept focusing on the negative. And she said, you know, you need to stop. Take a, take a step back. Take a deep breath. Every kid develops at their own time. Um, focus on their strengths. What are they doing well? You know, how What's they... your quote about turtles? Oh, uh, well, be the turtle. Be the turtle. Yes, <laughs> be the turtle. So I always think you should be the turtle. I... If you know me and if you work with me, you'll find out I have a lot of, like, little Emilyisms. Um, it's the way I live my life. I just kind of talk like that. We I have sh- a whole episode of Ninja Therapy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I basically, I, I talk like an old Southern grandma. Like, I'm going to come at you with all these little Emilyisms. Um, and I just... I can't help that. But, yeah, be the turtle. Slow and steady. It wins the race. You know, if you try to go things um, very fast, you're either going to fall or or it's just not going to not gonna work out for you. But, you know, all kiddos, all kiddos develop at their own time, you know, um, and they do. And so by uplifting their strengths and helping to build up their 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 weaknesses, um, you're going to have you're going to be a lot more successful. So those are the things that I talk about with parents. We talk about strategies for self-care, whether that be using the time timer in conjunction with visual schedules or um, once they master that task, what's next? You know, maybe using a smartwatch or um, using some sort of reminder. There's a lot of really cool apps out there that kind of help with keeping kids on track for chores or um, other areas age appropriate activities. Um, we talk a lot about, you know, parents kind of forgiving themselves a little bit, you know, because we tend to have a lot of guilt when we feel like our kid isn't, um, our kid isn't keeping up with other kids. And this is the way that I look at it. Like your kid is your kid. That's a special kid. He's going to grow and develop the way that it's going to work best for him. So we need to take a step back and figure out what is the best way for that kid to support that kiddo and their needs um, and help like I said, uplift their strengths and build up their weaknesses in order for them to be successful. Um, so, so that's kind of the common theme. The other common theme that I hear is parents don't know what resources are out there for them. You know, a lot of times they, they know about school. They might not necessarily know about the IEP process very well. They just kind of move through it. Um, they might know about, like, the medical model and outpatient therapy, which is awesome. Um, but a lot of times the community is just this kind of vast space. You know, they don't know that there's all these camps available, that there's funding sources available, that there are now so many different sensory friendly parks popping up and um, there's support groups and moms groups and all these other different resources out there um, where these people who, as I said before, feel like they're an island, there's all these bridges that are being developed. Um, And so that tends to be a big part of the conversation that I have with parents is providing them with um, the education so they know what resources are out there for them so they can start advocating on behalf of their own kids you know empowerment a, is a very a very special thing you know and so to be able to provide a little bit of that to the parents is has been a very cool experience 
So we've talked about a lot. We've talked about ninja therapy, we've talked about your history, we've talked about parenting and schooling and all that. What is one big takeaway from all of this that you want people to learn? If they don't learn anything else, what's the one big thing that you want people to take away? Oh, that I'm an awesome speaker. I'm oh, just yeah. kidding. Um, <laughs> so the, the big thing about sensory processing, the big thing about the kids that I see, a big thing about the parents that I meet is that it takes a village to raise your kid. You know, there's a lot of resources out there. There's a lot of people who are willing to share their experiences and share their knowledge. Um, And so just when those doors open, just walk through them because you never know what that person or that experience is going to bring to you. Um, The other thing about sensory processing is, you know, as parents, we, we need to kind of let ourselves off the hook a little bit. You know, our kiddos are going to develop in the time frame that works for them. You know, we need to provide things for them, but it's in their choice whether they eat or whether they participate. We just have to modify their environment for them to be as successful as possible. Give them the skills to be able to move from this chapter to the next chapter. Yeah. See, another Emilyism. <laughs> I think those are all the questions that I have at this time. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. No Very excited for you to be the first person on our podcast. I don't yeah. know. I don't know who else it would have been. <laughs> well, thank you. I talk a lot, so sorry, people out there, for you having to listen to me. But um, I fun. appreciate the opportunity, and um, you know, if you don't have an OT, find an OT. You know, they are great people. They do a lot of really great stuff. They are also really great problem solvers. You know, so if you are kind of struggling and you you do have an OT at school or you do um, have the ability to see one in a medical model or a community model, you know, reach out to them because they, they just want to help. Thank you for tuning into this month's episode of the eSpecial Needs podcast. We hope these tips helped you. Of course, please always consult a professional when it comes to the well-being of your loved one with special needs. While these tips may work for some, they might not be applicable to all. Please remember, you're doing great things. Keep it up. We'll talk to you next time.